Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be with you here this morning. Uh, the, we, we've arranged for two uh, talks, one after the other. Uh, the general heading is the Systemic Functional Research Potential. Uh, and the first one is concerned with the general options in research methodology in, in text and text-based research. Uh, now, the second one will focus specifically on text-based research uh, and corpus-related research. Uh, I'm happy to hear that you've had two hardworking great days so far, and uh, I'm very myself. Uh, that I can't be with you in person. It just has to do with the, the scheduling of uh, COVID-19 vaccination. Uh, but if I'm lucky, I will be able to see you in person uh, sometime uh, next year. I have very fond memories of interacting with a number of you a few years ago when you hosted that brilliant first uh, system and functional uh, conference in Tunisia. So this is where we're at in the schedule. Uh, we're a bit late, uh, about 45 minutes, I suppose. Uh, but I will uh, stop if you signal to me that I'm going on too, too long. Uh, and if we need to stop in the second talk, uh, because we are running into lunchtime, just let me know. Uh, I can recall the talks and share them with you. Uh, so that you can access them afterwards if there is a problem with timing. Uh, I think you will all have seen the abstract for this talk, uh, uh, but I was making the point about research, uh, we can, uh, uh, possibility of thinking of research as a bridge that we build between present questions, objectives, goals, and problems, and then in undertaking the research, we build a bridge to the future that we hope for. And the future will have answers to the research questions. We'll have met the objectives of the research. We've achieved the goals of the research and we have solved the problems uh, posed before we undertook the research. So the research methods then we can think of as the resources available to us in building this bridge. And I will present them uh, in, in a minute, uh, step by step, and I will represent them as a potential, as a kind of system at work where we make choices. Now, the choices will be set out as alternatives, but of course, we can always uh, have uh, more than one choice, uh, complementary or mixed methods, but I'll come back to that later. So this is notion of building a bridge to the future the future may be quite hazy. Uh, we may not be able to see the future, and that's often the case in research. When we write a research proposal, we have to be quite specific about what we want to try to achieve. But the problem is uh, the other end of the other bridgehead may not even be there. It certainly can be hit, hidden in clouds. Uh, so that's always a challenge in developing research uh, proposals. And somehow, sometimes, we'll find that we build a bridge and it doesn't actually lead to a point where we're hoping to get to. Okay, <laughs> let's try again. <laughs> so, Mm. Okay, I hope you can only see one slide. For some reason, there was a, a switch between the two, two monitors I use. In any case, okay, you can hear me and you can see one slide, one, one slide. Okay, that's great. Uh, so my warning was just uh, to uh, not to try to take on too much 
in a quantum of research. And that's part of research experience, of course, getting a sense of what can constitute one quantum of research. I won't talk about that further today. I'll focus on options, choices we make in, in terms of research method. So the research methods then, that those are the choices uh, I've been talking about. And uh, let me say something more about the choices then present them uh, step by step. So this is a representation of one option in the research methods, a very well-known one, qualitative versus quantitative. So method, a method involved in describing as opposed to measuring. And this is the representation of a choice. I think you're all familiar with this kind of uh, system network representation. I'll, I'll skip that introduction. Uh, so now you can see the uh, simultaneous choices uh, that we can mix and match, as it were, that I'll talk you through step by step. So it says at the left, linguistic research methods, and then the curly bracket indicates that all these choices, qualitative, quantitative, non-experimental, experimental, authentic, elicited, primary data, secondary data, are relevant and we can mix and match them. So we can have qualitative and experimental and qualitative and non-experimental and so on. And there is another uh, choice that becomes important uh, in the second talk, and that's between manual and automated analysis of text, but I'll come back to that. So for any choice that we're presented with, we'll have to consider which the appropriate option is to choose based on the nature of the research activity. Are we surveying a field? Are we hypothesizing? Are we testing? Whatever it might be. And also, of course, the researchers involved. Uh, for example, disciplinary expertise. Uh, if we're doing a PhD, essentially we have one researcher uh, and a, her or his expertise then will determine uh, what's feasible in terms of the choice of research method. If we have a team, uh, we may have complementary disciplinary areas of expertise. And then, of course, another important consideration is the research channel, as it were, the research facilities, equipment, uh, software licenses. Uh, all these will influence the choices we make. Uh, and that may, in turn, depend on sources of funding and so on. Now, I know myself that I've often conducted unfunded research, meaning research for which I've not received any funding money. Uh, so I've had to adjust the choices in the research accordingly. I couldn't get, uh, say, a, a, scan, a brain scanning device on my own, out of my own pocket money. Uh, so these choices will depend on the three groups of factors, the nature of the research activity, the nature of the researchers, and the research facilities. And these then will determine uh, how we make an informed choice. Now, a very familiar contrast is between qualitative and quantitative research. So in qualitative research, we describe, in quantitative research, we measure. And let me use uh, another person's presentation to characterize the difference, even though I think this is quite well known. So the contrast in the choice between quantitative and qualitative. Now we can actually interpret these. Uh, so one contrast is the field of activity. In quantitative research, typically people test hypotheses. In, quantitative res in qualitative research, they formulate re hypotheses. Secondly, they differ in the semiotic system that is foregrounded. Uh, so in quantitative research, it's broadly speaking, the semiotic system is mathematics. In qualitative research, broadly speaking, it's language. I'll come back to this in a second. Uh, and then where we located on the decline of instantiation, a few instances or many instances. 
Uh, so quantitative research typically demands a much larger sample size. So we have to sample more instances in order to be able to make uh, more solid generalizations. Qualitative research can often uh, work with a smaller sample size. And then the field of activity, again, uh, quantitative research, uh, very often mathematical or more specifically statistical analysis. Qualitative research may involve summarizing, categorizing, interpreting. So from our points of view, from our point of view as linguists, as semioticians, one critical difference has to do with the semiotic system that is foregrounded, supporting uh, the research if it's quantitative or qualitative. Now, a good deal of research in SFL, in systemic functional linguistics, has been qualitative. But there are certainly quantitative research projects and a growing number of them, uh, thanks to the research equipment becoming available, thanks to technology. Now, one fairly early uh, reference project in uh, quantitative research was a fairly major one undertaken by Rukai Hassan in the 1980s, uh, doing research into mother-child dialogue with a large data set and asking various questions and then using uh, systemic functional linguistics, uh, doing a semantic analysis of interaction between mothers and their young children, and then using uh, the principal components analysis strategy or quantitative research uh, to arrive at robust differences uh, between different groups of mothers and children. Uh, I think I'll just leave you with a yeah, I'll, I'll skip this. Uh, I'll also skip the illustration of how you can visualize cars in uh, quantitative research. That is very important because if you visualize them, so you go from the mathematics to visual representation, some kind of charting, that can actually help you then interpret the, uh, the, the quantitative tense in qualitative terms. And that's very important. Uh, but in the interest of time, let me skip that. Uh, this is a nice illustration, not from linguistics, but from uh, health demographics or more general demographics by a Swedish scholar, Hans Rössling. But I'll leave you with the URL. So let's get back uh, then to the choices. Uh, let me mention one more study that is helpful in thinking about research methodology, choice, quantitative uh, research. Uh, and that's uh, from a little bit later than Ruka Hassan's paper, uh, a corpus-based study uh, using the Birmingham corpus, the Bank of English, uh, with Michael Halliday as a visiting scholar and a local uh, computational linguist, Zoe James. Uh, quite a well-known study, a quantitative study of polarity in primary tense in the English finite clause, using about 18 million words. That was quite big at the time. Uh, now, let me mention other choices. Uh, so one has to do with the uh, status of uh, the data, authentic or elicited, meaning do we attend to phenomena that occur uh, naturally, authentically? If so, we have a choice. We can simply observe them and we can take field notes uh, the way an ethnographer or anthropologist might do. And we can go back and think about the early days when, in anthropology, Bronislaw Malinowski pioneered uh, the, what has become very central in modern anthropology, his field methods, participant observer. And this was in the 1910s, so there were no recording devices. So he depended on detailed systematic field notes, uh, and that still stands as a model in anthropology. Of course, technology has increasingly made it possible for us to record. So in addition to observing, we can now record, audio record, video record. And we've reached the point when in some sense technology is not really a, a, a threshold in, in recording, uh, but the threshold is set by eth ethical and legal considerations. Uh, so before being allowed to record, uh, we probably have to clear an ethics committee. Uh, and in many situations, it will be 
easier to, to get approval for audio recording than for video recording, uh, simply because with audio recording you can transcribe uh, and then uh, you can anonymize. It's harder with video recording. Uh, and I speak from our experience, for example, in doing research in healthcare communication, where it would be wonderful to have video recording so we can look at face-to-face -face interaction, including facial expression, gesture, and so on. Uh, but that's simply uh, incredibly difficult to get past an ethics committees, both in the university and the hospital. Now, the alternative to authentic data is elicited data. Uh, and in linguistics, of course, in fieldwork linguistics, there is a, a method of fieldwork elicitation. That can be done in different ways. Often, of course, translation of examples where the language consultant and the linguist in the field share one language. Uh, another example would be Ken Pike's uh, celebrated monolingual demonstrations where without a shared language, he, he was able to elicit quite a bit of information about the language and a description. The alternative is questioning, and that's perhaps more commonly associated with sociology, ethnography, uh, informal interviews, surveys, and surveys may take the form of structured interviews or questionnaires. And there are, of course, different possibilities, focus groups and so on. Now, I've said, as I said, I've set them up as alternatives, and they are, but we kind of choose, of course, choose more than one. And that's what we've done in our work, research in healthcare communication, both in Hong Kong and in Australia. Uh, and a few years ago, but half of 2015, uh, the research in Australia was reported on a book uh, spearheaded by Diana Slade, a uh, book is called Communicating in Hospital Emergency Departments. And that book, the research we undertook in Australia, illustrates uh, observing, recalling, uh, questioning, informal interviews, more structured interviews, questionnaires, and so on. Uh, and we have a few of us have a joint paper from a few years ago uh, on research case methods, specifically using ethnographic discourse analysis to understand doctor-patient interactions in clinical settings. Now, that's in the study of uh, healthcare uh, institutions, medical institutions. Uh, but of course, the general methodology is relevant to research in other institutions. Where you move into an institutional site, it might be educational, it may, might be criminal, whatever it is. Uh, the choice of research methods and the way that they use to uh, sort of illuminate uh, the phenomena under investigation from different angles, triangulation and the rest. Uh, is, is relevant. So this can be used as an illustration for research in other institutions. Uh, let me illustrate the sense of uh, shared uh, choices. So choices are more than one research method. Uh, and this diagram is organized from uh, what we can actually, uh, the first order of phenomena uh, and then upwards towards higher order of abstractions. So if you look to the left, you can see first order. Uh, this is what people say and do. So we can observe people doing things, say undertaking activities in hospital, diagnostic activities, whatever it might be, and also what they say. And this is what we're trying to get at by observing in field notes or recording and transcribing as we engage in the study of them. Now, we can also, of course, ask people, there's a second order, what people believe and say that they do and say. Now, importantly, it's not what they actually do and say, it's what they believe and say they do and say. And that's, of course, what we get at with questionnaires, interviews, focus groups, and the rest. So we have to take that with a grain of salt, because what they believe and say they do and say Can you still hear me? Okay, it seems you can, yeah. What people uh, believe uh, and say that they say, uh, do and say isn't necessarily what they actually do and say. So when we get to a third order, that's when we begin the study of, uh, of the phenomena. Uh, and as I said, we can study the phenomena directly or 
through the intermediate beliefs and, and locutions of uh, the participants. Then whether we have questionnaires, interviews, focus group, field notes, recordings, transcriptions, we can then uh, take another step uh, and begin the analysis. And then there are different types of analysis open to us. Uh, very often, of course, if people have questionnaires, interviews and so on, they do some kind of content analysis. From a linguistic point of view, uh, that is not very technical, uh, but we can also undertake a technical linguistic analysis, so text analysis, corpus analysis, contextual analysis. And then if we get to the fifth order and we have an accumulated set of studies, uh, then we can do a meta-analysis. So we can study what is reported in study one, study two, study three, up to any number of studies, uh, and we can see what motifs emerge from such meta-analysis. Now, I said this is comparable, and this is the kind of thing we did in uh, work in hospitals in Hong Kong and Australia, and it is still being carried out, uh, the kind of complementary methods. Uh, but we could do this for other institutions. So we can do this for institutional healthcare, as illustrated, but we can do it for institutional health of friendship or of the family, of education, workplace, and so on and so forth. And we'll be track, uh, keeping track of then other activities, the people taking part in these activities in different roles, and the nature of their uh, engagement with one another interaction. Now, let me get to another choice, uh, primary versus secondary data. I already alluded to the possibility of secondary data, but primary data then is uh, what we can observe, what we can record. Can you hear me now? Okay, <laughs> on we go. <laughs> Okay, sorry, I don't know exactly when when uh, uh, when you lost me, uh, but I'm talking about the choice between primary and secondary data. Uh, so primary data is what we can observe, uh, what we can record. Uh, secondary data is this data that has already been uh, processed, already been cooked uh, through analysis. Uh, and the way we deal with secondary data, of course, apart from picking it up in literature reviews and so on, is through meta-analysis and then synthesis of the results in meta-analysis. Uh, let me just point you to one example of this. Uh, the, uh, this the, this repo, uh, approach to the analysis of secondary data uh, started in medicine, was taken up in social sciences and imported into applied linguistics uh, by uh, uh, Lourdes Ortega and John Norris, and into systemic functional linguistics by Winfred Huam. Uh, here is an article from just a couple of years ago that illustrates this approach in the area of SFL. It's a systemic functional language typology and description. And what they did was look at existing descriptions according to criteria for which ones would be included, which ones would be excluded, and then they analyzed these. Uh, and you have a number of very interesting results. Uh, for example, the frequency distribution of different languages uh, other than English. So as you can see from the graph here, uh, the most studies were devoted to Chinese, followed by Spanish, followed by Japanese, followed by French. And then you have a whole range of languages uh, with only single studies like Wiri, Zapotec, Punjabi, Oko, uh, with couple. So this can be very useful as a stock taking where we at, uh, and this can guide us then in future research. So that's data. Uh, let me come back to the distinction between qualitative and quantitative and non-experimental and experimental, because they
Am I back? <laughs> okay. Uh, so let me just pick up the combinations. We have four combinations of these, the four common combinations. So the choice between qualitative and quantitative and between experimental and non-experimental. So let's look at the common combinations, which I've color coded here so you can see which combinations. Uh, so uh, let's take them uh, pair by pair. So qualitative and non-experimental. Uh, prototypical examples would be ethnographic approaches, including ethnographic interviews, focus groups, but also manual text analysis. So in manual text analysis, often people focus on a qualitative interpretation uh, rather than on counting. Contrast that with quantitative and non-experimental, the combination. So that would be, for example, quantitative surveys, evaluations of applications, and corpus analysis, automated corpus analysis. A lot of corpus analysis is, of course, geared towards uh, quantitative findings, towards measuring frequencies in the corpus. Qualitative and non-experimental, that would be uh, interviews with participants in an experiment. So in a sense, a subsidiary uh, activity to an experimental uh, research context. So you have a research context where there's an experiment, but then a qualitative subsidiary is you interview the participants in the experiment. Quantitative and non-experimental, uh, that would be... Um, uh, sorry, quantitative and experimental, uh, that's quite common in phonetics, in auditory phonetic experiments and in psycholinguistic experiments. So you can see that these occur in, in different ways. If you have quantitative and non-experimental, as I said, that's corpus analysis, and I'll come back to that in the second talk <laughs> if we get to that point. Now, some SFL examples, uh, so language description, uh, Isaac Winlaro, uh, I'll come back to, uh, quantitative corpus analysis. Uh, one person who's pushed this with sophisticated uh, automatic analysis techniques like data mining is Elke Teich in Germany and her research group in register analysis. Uh, what about experimental? Not so common in SFL, uh, but there is over the last decade, decade and a half, a very interesting uh, initiatives uh, taken in translation studies, specifically the study of translation processes uh, involving experimental setup where you uh, log the keystrokes by the translator and you track his or her eye movements as I sit in front of a monitor and do the translation. And that's a combination of psycholinguistic approaches by Fabi Alves uh, at UFMG in Belo Horizonte, April, uh, Brazil, and Eri Steiner and others in Germany. So that's a very interesting uh, frontier of research in the last decade, decade and a half. As I said, I'll say more about corpus analysis in the second talk. So that's talk two. But let me say a little bit uh, about it right now, and that's to do with the choice of manual versus automated analysis. So you remember that I said was the additional choice that I have more to say about in the second talk. So here we're dealing with text. It may be just a single text or a few text, or text compiled according to explicit criteria into corpus. If you look at the history of SFL research, uh, text-based research, uh, you'll see, of course, that there are many examples of manual analysis. So one very helpful reference point is Michael Halliday's uh, contribution to Turn Van Dyck's Handbook of Discourse Analysis. Uh, 
Okay, I think I'm back. So, as I said, one example in Michael Halley's contribution, but there are many others in the system functional literature, automated analysis, uh, a good uh, stimulating reading is the work by Elke Teich and her group, the linguistic construal of disciplinarity, a data mining approach to using register features. So that's becoming increasingly possible. Uh, there is, of course, the work in corpus linguistics, uh, but often the techniques, the automated te techniques are more sophisticated when they come from information science, natural language processing, and so on, as in the work by Elke Teich and her colleagues. Now, there is a trade-off here. If the analysis is manual, uh, we can only cope with a small amount of text, but we can go all the way up in the analysis, into semantics, into context. If the analysis is automated, we can deal with very large samples of text, but the level of analysis will be quite low. There's no way of doing fully automated semantic analysis or even functional clause analysis, uh, let it out contextual analysis. It can only be based on fragmentary clues. So note the trade-off here, the level of, of analysis and the volume of analysis. Manual analysis versus automated analysis. So in this schematic representation, uh, on the horizontal axis, you have the size of the sample from text that may be 100 to, uh, to 1,000 to 10,000 words uh, to reference corpora that get into millions of words, tens and hundreds of millions of words. As you know, this, the early corpora from the 1960s of English, they were one million, but that's actually very, very tiny in comparison what we need, in comparison with uh, modern corpus uh, sizes of tens or hundreds of millions of words that even flow through corpora or corpora that pretend that you can treat the World Wide Web as a corpus. So you get from a text to a corpus, maybe for register analysis or reference corpus, when you're trying to develop a reference description of a language. Now, on the other axis, the vertical axis, you have the level of the, or the, um, the stratum. So you can see the trade-off is manual analysis. You can go all the way up to context, but the sample has to be quite small, uh, maybe up to 10,000 uh, words or a bit more, but that's, that's the size we're talking about, uh, unless you have a team of analysts, well-trained analysts, Automated analysis, in principle, the sky is the limit, uh, but you stuck to it at a fairly low level. You can do graphological analysis with concordances, for example. You can uh, tag parts of speech, word classes. There are parsers around, uh, but from a factual point of view, the parsers, uh, the output of the parsers are not very rich. So that's the trade-off. If you just represent it in terms of um, this this diagram, uh, it's the same kind of thing. The technology has, over the last uh, few decades, been pushing upwards uh, towards automation of higher levels, uh, but we haven't had a real breakthrough yet. Now, just as an example, if you're interested in following up, you could look at research into uh, interpersonal assessment. So researching evaluations, appraisals, stances, attitudes, feelings, sentiments in text. And you can see the complementarity of manual and automated analysis. So for example, uh, in SFL, typically manual analysis, uh, one framework that's been proposed is appraisal analysis. What is appraisal analysis? Well, it's built on a description of the resources for evaluation in English. So it's not a theory, it's a description of English. And of course, it's also being developed for other languages, uh, documented in, in rich detail by Martin and White. This has the potential to be automated, but it tends to be analyzed uh, manually. At the other end, you have a cottage industry of 
automated analysis, typically called sentiment analysis. So that comes from natural language processing. And in between, you have the work by Doug Biber, for example, uh, Corpus Linguistics Dance Analysis. I've given the URL to a nice presentation by Siraj Raval of Sentiment Analysis in only four minutes. I won't play it now, but if you want to pursue. And then you have the book on the language of evaluation by Martin and White. And here is a paper by Doug Biber that in some sense faces both ways. It is automated, but it's more linguistic than sentiment analysis tends to be. So he asks about uh, how do lexicogrammatical stance features differ in use and how do registers differ in the use of stance features. So he's a fellow traveler. It's the kind of question uh, one would also ask in systemic functional linguistics. So wor worth looking at. Now, just that I've been talking about research op options in general. If you move into a particular area, there may be additional options to choose among. Uh, and I'll just briefly mention an example, research in uh, educational linguistics. So in educational linguistics, we have uh, various uh, questions like manual versus automated. Uh, we have questions of a general methodological nature. Do we analyze raw text or annotate, annotated text, the marked up text? Do we look at text as product or as process as it unfolds through time? But there are also questions that are more specific to educational linguistics, having to do with the phenomenon under focus. Uh, so if we think about focus of learning teaching in educational linguistics, uh, the phenomena may be concerned with language, that is learning how to mean, as in the childhood studies, about language, as the research into grammatics by Jeff Williams and others, or the focus may be on learning through language, that is language as a learning resource. And what, in that case, what's the role of the text? Do we take it as a specimen or as an artifact? I'll come back to this. But it's just an illustration. If you move into a particular research area, we may be able to sketch uh, further choices that are relevant to consider when we make them. Uh, and this is, of course, a well-known one in educational linguistics, language about language through language. And all three are relevant. Uh, but the question is then, in the research, do we focus on one or another, or do we try to focus on a kind of complementary options here? And then, as I said, uh, what's the nature of the text? Is it just raw text? Or has it been annotated, marked up in some way? And do we look at text at the end of its unfolding through time as product, or do we try to track it as it unfolds through time, as people do in translation research concerned with the translation process? Uh, now, winding up, up this, this, this talk, uh, let me just give you a table showing, not, not to take in now, but just that you can access it later on, uh, examples of studies from the SFL literature uh, that can serve as models when you explore the consequence of choosing one research option over another. Uh, and this will be published as chapter four in a book by Kazuhiro Toru and myself, hopefully next year with Rutledge, called Guide to Systemic Functional Linguistics. Uh, so that includes a table where you can look at key publications in the different areas, uh, and then you can refer to them and draw on them as you contemplate how you want to go about uh, designing your own uh, research proposal and your own research methodology. So next then will be the second talk where I focus on text-based research uh, and on corpus research and the complementary uh, approaches to these. Uh, that's the view from where I'm sitting in my study this morning. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm blessed with a nice blue sky, uh, lovely sunshine today. Uh, but let me stop at this point. Thank you. Um, you'll be writing questions. OK. Uh, so I will, I will look, uh, look forward to your written questions. Um, OK, you have a question. 
explain the difference between primary and secondary data. Okay, so primary data is uh, what you can, in principle, observe, uh, maybe the naked eye and naked ear, maybe with uh, sort of technological enhancement, uh, like a, a brain scanning device, for example, or a sensitive equipment in auditory phonetics, or indeed in articular phonetics. But in any case, you can observe it and you can record it. Uh, and But secondary data, so that's what we could call raw data, right? Raw data. But secondary data has already been cooked. It has been cooked by typically by others, uh, by having been uh, observed and recorded and then anal an analyzed. So secondary data comes to you as already analyzed data. So it, with sec what you do with secondary data is uh, you analyze their analysis. So that's the notion of meta-analysis. Uh, it may be uh, from surveys, from questionnaires, uh, where you have the counts, and then you take one study, you take another study, you take another study, uh, and you summarize what these different studies have achieved. Uh, the example I gave was uh, just a simple one. It was Ike's and, and Winfrey's uh, analysis of what has been done in terms of language description SFL. I think I can hear you now. Uh, so that's information about studies that already been done, uh, rather than about the languages that were studied. Uh, so they give information about how many studies of a particular language, uh, what was the language used in presenting the studies, where in the world did they take part, uh, what was the meta function they focused on, and so on and so forth. Uh, so secondary data then goes with uh, meta-analysis, so analysis of the analysis and of synthesizing the results of that analysis. Uh, as I mentioned briefly, it's not been very common in linguistics, uh, but it's becoming increasingly common because it's very attractive. It goes with the move towards uh, sharing not only data, but sharing analysis and building on the, on the shoulder of giants. As, as Newton said in a, in a letter to Hook uh, many years ago. But in any case, uh, that approach, the meta-analysis of secondary data, means that we can accumulate more information. It's not been so common in the humanities. Humanities had te has tended to be uh, dominated by single researchers, as it were. Uh, but historically, it uh, got started in medicine Took on it was taken on in social sciences, uh, and as I said, was taken into applied linguistics by uh, two very good applied linguists, John Norris and Lourdes Ortega. And Lourdes Ortega is at Georgetown University, uh, and that, as I said, is very helpful in getting us a sense how collectively we can achieve much more than we can achieve individually. Is that a fir good, okay first round of, of uh, explanation? Okay, thank you. Good. Uh, second question. Okay, let me read. If automated analysis is low level and manual analysis is more into context, what do you recommend? Uh, stick to manual or use both? Well, thank you. That, uh, I think, is, is a very crucial question and uh, very important for us to, to think about uh, and uh, deal with uh, at the present time. Uh, my sense is both. I mean, find, find ways of, of uh, creating them as, as complementary uh, approaches. But let me introduce this by a little anecdote. Uh, a somebody who was a good 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 friend and a great linguist uh, who we lost in in 2021, Michael Hoy, uh, at a congress in Liverpool in 2002, uh, he gave a talk, and talk went something like this. You can't hear me. 
Uh, my microphone is on. Oh, you can hear me. You can. Oh, okay. So, okay, great. So, what Mikey Ho, Mike Hoey said was he started out life as a discourse analyst. So, he did manual analysis and his book from the early uh, 80s on the surface of discourse uh, is a nice example of this. So, he's working on this at the same time as in, in Southern California, we were developing rhetorical structure theory. Then at some point, because he was in Birmingham, he came across corpus linguistics and he fell in love with corpus linguistics. Uh, and he focused on the kind of automated analysis you can go do with corpus linguistics. Uh, but after being in love with corpus linguistics for a while, he said at this talk, he, re he, re he remembered that he was a discourse analyst. And then he set about to try to combine the two techniques. Uh, and he was concerned with something that uh, I've also been concerned with, and Robert uh, Longacre uh, was concerned with, uh, the, for the paragraph size patterns, where in manual analysis you can pick up significant patterns sort of on the range of a paragraph, say, beginnings of paragraphs, ends of paragraphs, transitions between paragraphs. And if you find them in manual analysis and you find certain uh, patterns of wording, then you can do uh, automated analysis over much larger samples. So that's one way of combining manual and automated analysis. You can start with manual analysis, and then you can see if there are certain patterns that seem significant, uh, and you think you would be able to analyze automatically because they have lexical, grammatical item combinations say a verb and a noun, for example, or a verb and an adverb. So something I did looking at, uh, at collocations of verbs and adverbs of uh, degree or intensity. You want something dab badly, uh, but you love deeply uh, and you understand completely. So badly, deeply uh, and completely, uh, these are different ways collocate with different uh, verbs and there's a pattern to that once you found them in some manual analysis you can do the automated analysis but of course you can do it the other way around you can uh, do the automated analysis as a kind of trawling expedition and you can see if it throws up interesting uh, patterns uh, that then are worth looking into in more detail manually so as a general answer to this very crucial question i would say uh as complementary methods, both. Now, what I myself find when I read a lot of, of uh, uh, presentations of studies in corpus linguistics is I don't get a sense of the text. Uh, maybe there are not even any examples from the text, lots of counts, but it doesn't give me a sense of the text. Similarly, of course, if I read papers that are only based on manual discourse analysis, I wonder, but how representative are these? Now, if you turn to the corpus linguistic uh, papers, I would say, absolutely, please uh, add manual analysis. Allow readers to get a sense of the flavor of the text, what's going on in the text. I think that's crucially important. And it has to do with the notion of, uh, of what Gu Yigo, uh, a colleague in Beijing, called situated discourse. Well, from a systemic functional point of view is simply text in context. Uh, and that's kind of been a tension, a methodological tension between say, what you get in the Birmingham approach, John Sinclair and others, and what you get, for example, in conversation analysis, to choose two examples outside of SFL. In conversation analysis, it's manual analysis of detailed analysis, sociological analysis, not really linguistic analysis, sociological analysis, or fairly short text where the context is known. At the other end, you have the massive, I lost the connection. I don't know if you can still hear me. Can you still hear me? Okay. At the other end, 
you have the sort of mega corpus approach uh, pioneered among others by John Sinclair uh, with the Bank of English. But now, of course, there are many of them. But here you're dealing with a sample of text where you have no sense of the context or situation of the different text samples. So there is quite a tension here. What I'm advocating is uh, that we, as Gui Guo says, uh, we build corpora of situated text, or situated discourse, of text in context, so that even if we have a mega corpus, each text, for each text, we know the context. And that means we can move in with manual analysis. And we also avoid the approach taken in the early corpora of cutting off, say, collecting only 2,000 running words or 5,000 running words. That's absolutely no good if you want to be able to do manual uh, text analysis, manual discourse analysis. Back. Yes, you are back. Thank you very much, Professor. Well, thank you. It was really thank very interesting. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Can you hear us now? Can you hear us now? I can actually hear you now. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, yes. uh, you will hear the applause. Yes, works. thank you. It's, okay, it's so this is what you could see. Yes, beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so I will I will make available to you a recording of the second talk. Yes, okay. please. Thank you very much. Okay. We'll be sharing it with all the participants. Thank you again. Thank, Thank you, again. you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Ciao.